Are the Jaguars even good? They have paid young talent like Trevor Lawrence and Tyson Campbell, but this team can't stop being mediocre. Will that change in 2024? Let's go ahead and discuss. What's crackalack? It's your boy Bro Schmo, just in case you did not know so. And we're back again with the deep dive series where we take a look at each and every NFL team and project how they're going to do in 2024. And today, I got your Jacksonville Jaguars. That's right. But before we look and project how they're going to do this season, got to go back, take a look at how they did last year. Jaguars began the year looking really good versus the Colts, except for Tank Bigsby. He had a fumble that resulted in a Colts touchdown, and then he had a pass bounce off his helmet that was intercepted, and that just kept the Colts in the game. Ultimately, they did win 31-21, but the playmakers for the Jags were anything but. An affliction of drops cursed the Jaguars in the next two weeks in losses to the Chiefs and the Texans, but then they headed to London, which is just another home game at this point for the Jaguars as they're 3-1 since 2021, and they got back-to-back -back wins against the Falcons and the Bills. The Jags would win the final three games before their bye week behind a very good defense, but they would be humbled coming out of their bye by the 49ers 34-3. The passing attack and the defense would rebound in wins versus division rival Titans and Texans, and everything was looking on the up and up. They were looking good. They were at 8-3 and, and in line to compete for the one seed in the AFC. But then the world came crashing down in week 13 versus the Bengals. Trevor Lawrence would suffer a high ankle sprain during the game and Jacksonville would fall short in overtime. Lawrence would play the following week versus the Browns, but he kept throwing interceptions and on top of that, the offensive line, the, the injuries there would just start piling up. The next week against the Baltimore Ravens, the Jaguars suffered from a strain of bad luck as they missed multiple field goals. Trevor Lawrence fumbled on a scramble and scoring position and just a multitude of other things. Lawrence would be put in concussion protocol after the game and he was able to play the following week versus the Bucks, where he played poorly and he injured his AC joint in his shoulder. So yet another injury to Trevor Lawrence. C.J. Beathard would start against the lowly Panthers and the Jags got their first win since week 12. And then Lawrence would return for the season finale against the Titans and they basically goofed on their final drive to tie up the game. So after an 8-3 start, Jacksonville would finish the season 1-5. Mike Caldwell would be fired along with several other coaches. The Jaguars finished 9-8 and in terms of efficiency, they were pretty middle of the pack aside from their run game EPA where they ranked second to last among the league. I'll talk a little more about that later when we get to the coaching, but Jacksonville had the sixth hardest schedule among the league, and I'd argue the first half of the schedule was just as difficult and if not more difficult than their second half. The difference was the health of Trevor Lawrence, the health of the left side of the offensive line, and the run game just got worse as the season went on, and once the passing game began to struggle, this team was just cooked. Real quick, I got to give a shout out to today's sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. I absolutely love Underdog Fantasy because I love football, and now that the football season is far and away, it doesn't mean my betting season has to be because they do all kinds of sports, whether it's baseball, basketball, esports even, they got you covered, whether that's weekly best ball or my favorite, higher, lower on player props. So if you sign up at Underdog Fantasy using promo code BROSHMO, then they will give you a first time deposit up to $250. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So if you're going to go and bet, bet with Underdog Fantasy, use promo code BROSHMO, take advantage of this offer, but please bet responsibly and bet within your means. When it comes to what they added this offseason, I think the Jags did a relatively good job. They went out, they got Eric Armstead, which I think is going to be a pretty huge addition to the interior of that defensive line, but he is on the older side. I think he's about to be 31, and he is coming off a couple of years with injury. So that's going to be something to watch out for, but he is an addition to that defensive interior. There's no doubt about that, and they also brought in some young talent on the interior that they could hopefully coach up and develop, and now you get a really good mentor in Eric Armstead. They also brought in Gabe Davis. I think he was a little overpaid, is what it is. Some people are going to point to, well, they did this with like Zay Jones and Christian Kirk, and one of those worked. 
That's great, but I don't know. I mean, I st Gabe Davis is so hard to predict. He could be just utterly really good as a vertical threat or just pull this whole Houdini and maybe have like one reception. That, that was kind of the his tail the last two seasons with the Bills. So three years, 39 million, felt like a bit much, but I mean, it's not, I feel like they, I think contract wise, they could get off that contract after a year or two. So all in all, not terrible, not terrible, especially when you consider what they added in the first round, which we'll get to in a moment. Mitch Morris, he's going to be some nice consistency on that offensive line. This offensive line really struggled. And to be fair, they were hurt. And they were mainly hurt on the left side as you had guys like Cam Robinson. Uh, you had Walker Little. Uh, Ezra Cleveland eventually went down with injury. And Luke Fortner was just straight up cheeks. I tried to tell you Jaguar fans after his rookie year, be like, okay, well, let's pump the brakes. I don't think he, he I th think there was plenty there where it's like, okay, he was a rookie. He struggled at points. Let's reel back and let's set our expectations pretty mid. And then he fell short of those expectations. So now he gets replaced by honestly someone who's going to be more reliable in Mitch Morris on a really good contract, two years, 10 and a half million. So I like that one quite a bit. They also, uh, they did bring in technically Ezra Cleveland halfway through the season. Unfortunately, he did get hurt, but he's someone who's, I thought was more of this like wide zone, outside zone type of blocker from the guard position. And when we get to the coaching, this was a team that didn't run a lot of outside zone. And when they did, they did it in the most inefficient manner and doing it out of shotgun. So we'll see. I don't know if things are going to change with the run scheme a bit this season. And I don't know how Ezra Cleveland is going to play into that. So that, that's going to be fascinating. Darnell Savage, he's coming in and he actually played pretty well for the Packers when they lined him up in the nickel. And I think that's basically what he's going to be asked to do uh, coming here in Ryan Nielsen's defense, who's going to be more, he's more of this bump and run uh, man coverage type of DC. So I think he's actually going to play really well to that. He just was never really a good fit for Joe Barry's defense. And you kind of saw that fall off after his rookie year. So I, li I really like the addition there. They bring in Joey Sly, as well as drafting Cam Little, who we'll talk about when we get to their, their draft, to replace, uh, who was it? Um, was it McManus? Brandon McManus last season. So they're going to have a bit of a kicker competition in camp. So it's kind of worth noting. But they also bring in, let's see, da -da -da -da, Ronald Darby, who probably ends up being the starting corner for this squad uh, opposite of Tyson Campbell. I think he's a good fit. It's just uh, he's definitely kind of this bridge replacement level starter at this point. He hasn't had an interception since I think 2019. He's someone who's really struggled with injuries over the last like four or five years. So uh, whatever they have behind him, which we'll get to when we talk about the defense, I feel like is going to have to develop fairly, fairly quickly. I mean, fairly quickly. Devin du DuVernay is more of the return option here as they didn't re-sign uh, Jamal Agnew. So he comes in to do that. Travis Gibson honestly could end up being like a really solid player for the squad as a rotation guy. He really hasn't been able to put together a good season since I think it was his rookie year where he was opposite of Robert Quinn for the Bears. And a lot of people were like, oh man, He's coming out, watch out. And then he ends up being this guy bouncing around rosters. He was with the Titans at one point. But uh, I still think the potential is there. And maybe he can serve as like this, uh, uh, this smoot role who's now, I think, with the Bills. Or honestly, I can't remember where he ended up going. I know he at this juncture, he, he is firmly a backup, maybe even low end, mid end rotation starter. Uh, what else did this team add? I think uh, for the most part, that's it. We're, we would just be talking about some of the guys that they re-signed. So let's go ahead. Let's get into this draft. So with their first round pick, they actually initially traded back and then landed Brian Thomas Jr. And I love it. I kind of feel like he does clash a little bit with 
what Gabe Davis brings to the field is just the ceiling on Brian Thomas is a hell of a lot bigger. He's someone who I thought if he decided to return would be talked about as a uh, a top 10 type of prospect with guys like Luther Burden uh, and um, uh, McMillan from Arizona. But he did come out and ended up being the fourth wide receiver off the board. And I love the potential. I truly, truly do. Given Trevor Lawrence more weapons, I think is never a bad answer, especially now that they've paid Trevor Lawrence. So I liked that first round pick, especially that considering that they traded back, grabbed extra draft capital. And then in the second round, they, this is a true like Trent Bulky pick, and I don't mind it. Like Mason Smith, someone with a lot of upside. You love what he brings just from a physical standpoint, length, strength, the quicks. This was this was someone, if you remember, played strictly out on the edge his freshman year, had the injury, unfortunately, his sophomore year. And then last year, played more interior-wise and was kind of learning as he went. So someone definitely that they're going to have to develop, but the ceiling on Mason Smith is huge. And honestly, didn't realize how many LSU players that the Jags took until like going back and looking at this because there's going to be another guy we talk about. But then they go Jerry and Jones in the third round. And this one's fine. Uh, I think at least initially, he, I don't think he's going to contend for the the slot spot, I think that is Darnell Savage's, unless they plan to play Savage as kind of like a, a hybrid safety slash slot. Jones is someone who could play inside and out. I think he, he's got a great build, good length. Uh, I just do, like, sometimes I just don't feel like he plays physical enough, but he's a good player. This is about where I had him, and this is a team that desperately needed to add some players at that corner position add some depth some developmental options and they did that with this pick and another pick we'll get to a little bit later in the fourth round they get javon foster don't i think this guy's probably going to be a high-end backup which hey this was a team that had a lot of injuries last year but you also have walker little and cam robinson i think in the final year of their contract so maybe someone you're looking at as a potential future starter but i don't necessarily love the the ceiling of Javon Foster, but he is someone with good length that I think can be a high-end backup who maybe even does have star potential, but good pick. It was the right uh, right range for him. And then they grabbed Jordan Jefferson in the fourth. I thought this was a little high, but again, they're going back to the LSU well and going back to the interior well as they get someone with a little bit more play strength, plays with that, that, that feist on the interior, but probably high like at best case scenario could be like a high 10 rotation player like that's probably the ceiling on him because i think i had him as more of a sixth seventh round pick and then in the fifth round they get deandre prince out of mississippi ole miss and this is gonna be interesting because i think at least from a physical standpoint like yeah, he could be a good scheme fit, but I did have him projected in terms of his role as more of an off coverage corner. But we'll see. This was a fifth round pick. You're taking a shot on a guy. It's fine. This was about the range I had him in. So I thought it was a okay, fine pick. Let's move on. They go. Uh, this was probably this was the first pick I was like truly thought was not great. Uh, you have Cleland Robinson, who is a small running back out of Texas. Wasn't used a ton because he was stuck behind the, the the sheer depth that they have at running back there at Texas, whether it was Bijan and Roshan, or you had CJ Baxter and Jonathan Brooks last season. He was stuck behind those guys in terms of depth. But he does re bring return capabilities. I had him as a UDFA, more of a priority free agent. So for me, it was a bit of a reach at 167. And then they snag a kicker in the sixth round, Cam Little. I'm kind of fine. I don't mind if you take shots on kickers in like the sixth, seventh round. I mean, me personally, I'm like, hey, just bring in a couple of guys as UDFAs. Because there was still a pretty solid like kicker class left after the draft. But I get it with losing McManus last year I and mean, this was a team that also struggled from like 50 plus in terms of just field goals so like I get I get taking a shot at that position I mean to be fair hey kickers 
They score the most points of any other position in the NFL. So just saying, just saying. And then they wrapped up the draft with, uh, well, Trent Bulky, just Trent Bulky. And as Miles Cole, more of a physical guy with a lot of physical tools, good size, great length, good explosiveness. Just like, but outside of that, his game is like very unpolished. No true pass rush moves to him outside of just a long arm uh, and a bull rush. Like someone who definitely needs developed, probably ends up on the practice squad. But you do kind of love the tools of someone like Miles Cole. But let's go ahead. Let's get into this coaching staff. At head coach, you have Doug Peterson, who is in year three. And kind of feels like a potential make or break year for him after that first year of like, hey, Urban Meyer sucked and... This team started showing the promise. Last year, things kind of fell apart. And to be fair, like some of that was injury, especially with Trevor Lawrence. He had the concussion, the ankle sprain, and the AC joint in his shoulder. All at the back half of the year, you had the left side of your offensive line just kind of hurt, banged up. But, but to be fair, like I think the offensive play calling was pretty uninspired. Like, uh, if you're unfamiliar with Peterson, he was and he was the former head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles that year that they won the Super Bowl with uh, Nick Foles and Cam um, or Carson Wentz. And prior to that, he was an OC under uh, Andy Reid. So he does bring a bit of that modern day pro spread. But he also runs a ton of inside zone. Like, I think he led the league in inside zone uh, just usage. But, like, this was a team that almost was exclusively looking to run it up, like the B and the C gap. And I kind of mentioned it earlier when they did go to outside zone, they were super inefficient because they were doing it from shotgun. Because, I mean, hey, that's kind of the Andy Reid philosophy. You ain't taking it under center. Man. We're doing this from shotgun. And when it comes to outside zone, wide zone, those blocking schemes just don't tend to work from a shotgun just because of, well, angles and whatnot. You typically want uh, a bit more time for those guys to get out in space, like those guys by meaning blockers, the offensive line, to get out in space and to find, find those guys to basically just mow them down. And when you do that from shotgun, you're getting the ball into the run back's hands a bit early, a bit sooner. He's not getting that running start. He's not really getting that natural just like run out uh, to the angle. And it just it, it just hurry thing, it hurries things up. And it, it just doesn't work that way. At least it hasn't really worked that way in the NFL. But I it would be nice to see, especially when you have someone as athletically gifted as fast as a Travis Etienne, you want to kind of start, you want to utilize that outside zone, but I'd like to see them do that a bit more under center and maybe even set up the play action a little bit better. So it's going to be interesting to see if Peterson opens up the bag a little bit because we have seen it. We saw it in Philly. Will he open the bag up? Will he open the playbook up a little bit when it comes to this offense? And I do, I do think he will. Um, just kind of like waiting and, and want to see what, what we got here. Press Taylor is your offensive coordinator. He's come out and said, hey, I'm not the play caller here. Uh, so it's like there, there's really not much to talk about when it comes to uh, Taylor. He was with Peterson as a QB coach back in Philadelphia. Prior to that, he was an assistant, offensive assistant for the Colts. But let's talk about this defense because I absolutely love Ryan Nielsen and Unfortunately, last last year, he called a hell of a good defense and that kind of got lost in the sauce, so to speak, with just all the drama around Arthur Smith and the Falcons offense. And we, we just tend to forget how good of a freaking DC, uh, how good of a defensive minded coach freaking Ryan Nielsen is. He has been he's been a very, I would say, I don't want to say accomplished, but He's been a very good DC since leaving the uh, tutelage of Dennis Allen. And much like Dennis Allen, he's bringing that 4-3 defense. He's bringing, um, he tends to like his, his stunts 
a bit more than his uh than actually going out and blitzing uh again this is a guy that's just going to be doing stunts over blitzes that that's just who he is but you really see a lot of press coverage a lot of bump and run so it made sense with like a smaller corner like Darius Williams. They're like, yeah, we're, he's a really good corner, but we'll probably need to let this guy go, which honestly works out for Williams because now he goes back home to the Rams and gets to play in a scheme he's exceptionally familiar with because I, I assume it's not going to change much from uh, Raheem Morris, who is now in Atlanta. But yeah, man, I'm, I, I like this for Tyson Campbell. I am a bit worried and a bit concerned when it comes to that cornerback two spot. We'll talk a little bit more about that when it comes to the the roster, the defensive side of that. But let's discuss some of the uh, the other coaches, the positional coaches on this staff. Switch over here. As uh, the first thing sticks out, it, well, the first thing that sticks out to me is Chad Hall. I remember this cat out of, I think he was a receiver out of Air Force. When he initially got drafted and really didn't do anything in the NFL. But now as a wide receivers coach, pretty darn solid. Not half bad. You have Mike McCoy, who is the quarterback's coach here. And another guy that's just been around the NFL for a good long while. Uh, you have Jerry Mack replacing, uh, oh, who was the previous running back coach here? It was like Ernie something, right? Oh, I can't remember off the top of my head. But he, he is now the new running backs coach. See if maybe he could develop like a Tank Dell there who kind of struggled his rookie year. When it comes to some of the guys on the defensive side of the football, you got Chris Richards, who's just a really good defensive back coach. Uh, you also have uh, Corey Robinson here as the cornerbacks uh, coach slash defensive assistant you like that. You got uh, Jer Jeremy Garrett as the defensive line coach. So a couple of good names here. As per usual, you will see my grades for each position group over here. Let's go ahead. Start with quarterback and Trevor Lawrence. And people, I don't think people really think about what did Lawrence have to deal with last year. I mean, if you just take away the injuries. But this team was last in the league in yards after the catch. Like it was on Lawrence's shoulders to get it done through the air because no one was producing after the catch. Also, he was first in the league in terms of yards taken away by penalties. So not only are we saying, hey, your receivers, your play, your, your pass catchers aren't producing after the catch, but hey, when you do get a completion, Screw that crap. We're taking it away. On top, the Jags, they, they averaged almost two turnovers a game. They almost averaged a fumble a game. Just a wow. This was a team constantly coughing up the football. And I mean, with Lawrence, like you, you'll look at those interse that interception total, 14. Not a lot of that was on Trevor Lawrence. Like I think I said at the beginning, like we started the year with uh, an interception off of Tank Bigsby's helmet. And I mean, he, he, this team struggled with drops. They were among uh, the bottom of the league when it came to how often they dropped the football uh, when they did get in scoring position. Like, field goals outside of 50 yards, they were, near again, near the bottom of the league in converting those. So, yeah, Lawrence was dealing with a lot. Am I saying, oh, he's the best quarterback in football? No, definitely not. Not right now. But... I do think he is a top 10 to 12 quarterback as it stands. He should be in that discussion. We already know the arm talent, phenomenal. I think as a processor, he could probably do a little bit better. He, he will at times still put the ball in harm's way. Like uh, he had the those three interceptions versus Cleveland, but also keep in mind, he was playing that game a hurt, a hurt, hurt, hurt. And that was only after the first injury. Cause it only got worse from there on out with the concussion with the shoulder injury so like lawrence now being fully healthy adding a playmaker to the mix and hopefully maybe getting some guys that can create after the catch could go i think will go a long way and on top of that you also are gonna get well you're hopefully gonna get a healthy christian kirk as he missed a couple of games last season with injury what was it specifically he had a core and a groin injury and he ended up only playing 12 games and he is this team's best target 
Like Christian Kirk is this team's uh, best wide receiver. I mean, he, don't tell me, oh, Calvin Ridley was that guy. He was so inconsistent last year. I mean, you, you look at this dude's drop rate last season, and he was at 8.4%. Kind of significant. Kind of significant. And then we could talk about the run game, which, I mean, really, you look at that B-, and all that is just Travis Etienne. Because the guys behind him, I got no faith in. And Travis Etienne, unfortunately, with this team not being that good at blocking and kind of being predictable when it came to their play calling, when it came to the run, it, it took its toll. Like, Travis Etienne, very good at creating forced missed tackles. Like, his forced missed tackle rate, it's up there among the top of the league. But then you look at yards after contact because he was getting hit so stinking early, and he's under that three yards after contact, which it's like, ah, you want to be three or more. Like, four is great. Four is, like, best of the best. Anything under three, and it's like, okay, we need to improve in, in this facet. And a lot of that was, is on the offensive line. And we could go ahead and just, like, jump and talk about the offensive line before we really get into the, the depth of this squad, or I would dare say when it comes to the running back room, the lack thereof. But let's talk about the offensive line. Uh, Cam Robinson, man, he honestly, solid, solid tackle. He had the uh, suspension early in the year where he missed, I think, what, like six games or so? Something like that. He also had a knee injury he was dealing with. But he he, he, is, he is a very solid guy. I think he gets um, a lot of flack. And to be fair, I put out a lot of flack there probably like three years ago about uh, Cam Robinson just kind of being mid. But I think he he's developed into a relatively fine offensive tackle for the squad but keep in mind he is coming into the final year of his contract next to him it's going to be Ezra Cleveland will this team play more outside zone and take advantage of what I think Cleveland's best at being a outside zone wide zone blocking guard can he stay healthy kind of hoping kind of hoping and then you got Walker Little kind of hanging around his depth whether it's at the guard or the tackle position you get Mitch Morris there at center. I think that's a huge upgrade over stinking Luke Fortner, who gave up 28 pressures last season, gave up four sacks, just wasn't good. Wasn't good as a run blocker either. So Mitch Morris is already a significant improvement. You go to the right sideline where I think it's a little bit more dependable. You got uh, Brandon Sheriff. He ain't, he ain't what he once was, but... He's still hella solid, still hella good, very good pass protector, and he does enough as a run blocker, can still get those pancakes time and time again. Uh, he's fine there. You're just kind of hoping he can stay healthy, which I think he did last season. He uh, don't believe he missed any games. Yeah, he didn't miss any games last year and was, if I'm going to be honest, their best offensive lineman last season. And then Anton Harrison, who I liked exceptionally coming out of the draft out of Oklahoma, someone who I thought had the athletic profile, most definitely. He had the length. Uh, I thought his hands could be a bit wide, but he was someone that he, he came with that, that, that competitiveness as a hand fighter and someone who, who can uh, just, just win with his hands and where he needs to put it together is the footwork but he's a good enough athlete where it's like okay that's something you can develop because we already know he has the ability to be good at that just based on his athletic profile when it comes to like hand fighting you know a lot of guys just aren't going to have that pop a lot of, the, a lot of guys just aren't, aren't going to be committed to keeping their hands more inside uh they're just going to be consistently like especially if you got that length you're just going to be consistently kind of this Guy that attacks with wide hands, which is going to lead to a hell of a lot of holding calls. Uh, last season, when it came to Anton Harrison, he was flagged seven times. That's a little. That's not terribly high. That's probably around middle of the league, about six to seven. But yeah, I think he's going to in his rookie year. He showed enough to where it's like you, you feel good about him. And like the off again, the offensive line. It's not wowing me. Like I, I think it's going to be a very as long as they're healthy, a very good pass blocking unit. It's just when it comes to what these guys offer as run blockers and what this team's going to do schematically when it comes to Doug Peterson, 
are they going to be able to get it done as run blockers? That's why I have them at the bottom of the league. When it comes to their pass catchers, you still got Christian Kirk, who was the number one weapon here, and he probably still will be. You have Evan Ingram, who's, hey, fun fact, hella good. Had what? Let's take a look. Had 900 yards last season. He had four tutties. He, uh, I think he almost set the reception record for tight end last season. With He had 114 receptions. But now you add Brian Thomas to that outside. I think that's exceptionally dangerous. I think he has a chance to develop into one, one of the better uh, re wide receiver ones in the league. But again, he's a rookie. You, you, you're going to kind of have to wait and see. You got Gabe Davis. Are we going to see this Houdini act again? Is it going to be just a bit more of what we saw in Buffalo where, oh, when he explodes, it, it, it's going to be a big performance, but you can't trust him on the game-to-game -game basis? I don't know, but honestly, I think you could live with that if he's kind of your third or fourth option in this offense, and I think that's probably going to be the case. Let's take a look at uh, the, the rest of the receivers here. For the Jags as Parker Washington, we saw a little bit of last season there at the tail end. Uh, he's, I, he, I think he's more of a slot. I don't think he's a guy that's really ever going to be an outside receiver. Uh, then again, I mean, last year he only played 25% on the outside. So like more so, it's he's kind of a fail safe if Christian Kirk gets hurt. But if like, dude, if you're down Davis or Tom or Thomas, like, Who's the, who the hell stepping in? You got Devin Duvernay. He's undersized. He's he's again more of this like return threat. That's why you bring him to the squad. You got Tim Jones, who's fine. Like he's all right, but he's like roster bubble all right. So it would be nice if there was someone else there on the outside that you could feel a bit more confident in. Then again, I mean Christian Kirk. He. he I don't know, man. I'm not sold that Christian Kirk's an outside wide receiver, but it has some. It has been something he, he's done in his career. You go back to uh, Arizona, but maybe someone ends up making the roster, like a Seth Williams, who was at Auburn a few years ago, who was kind of this big body vertical guy, uh, very similar to what they have in Thomas and Davis. Uh, you got Elijah Cooks, who's more of a big body possession receiver. So a little bit different than what you have. Can he maybe beat out a Tim Jones for that wide receiver five or six spot? It's kind of a long shot, but I mean, it's going to be guys you're going to want to keep tabs on during training camp. Uh, I don't can't really tell you much about some of their UDFAs here outside of Joshua C uh, Cephas. Uh, who was really just a slot receiver from UTSA. Didn't have like crazy speed, but very good possession guy who had some highlight catches, but also had some ball skill concerns. But again, he's more of a, a slot player who is going to be in contention there with Parker. But I mean, how much contention does he really have? Couldn't tell you much about Austin Trammell, uh, but hey, Denzel Mims, man, he's still floating around the league. Like, if you still believe in that rookie season, he might be a guy to watch out for in training camp. He truly, truly might be a long shot, but he's a guy to watch out for. And then at tight end, your backups there, you have uh, Luke Farrell, who's more of this all-around tight end. You have Brenton Strange, who they drafted in the second round, didn't really see a lot of time last season. Kind of fine. I wasn't that high on him. I think I had him as like a maybe at best back into the third round. I think it was more of an early day three pick uh, for me. I mean, we saw a couple of those tight ends go early, like Luke uh, Schoonmaker and Brent Strange was that other one. And then it ended up being this this run on tight ends in the 2023 draft, which is kind of wild. I mean, some of them were good, in my opinion. Like you had uh, like Tyler or Tucker Craft, who I really liked coming out of South Dakota State, but. Strange just ends up being another one. These guys where it's like, okay, did you spend your second round pick on a tight end too? Okay. Uh, we got Josiah Degara, who is more of this like H-back 
kind of flexible, can line up in the backfield, could make the roster if they're looking for someone like that. Uh, you got Doug Peterson's son, Josh Peterson, who was out of Louisiana Lafayette, no, Louisiana Monroe a couple years back, but I think he was a little thin. Um, you could tell he was more of like this practice squad type of player. I uh, can't tell you much about Patrick, uh, was it Mutag? Ah, I can't even say that. I'm just going to butcher your name, but he's part of the International Pathway Program. Uh, Sean Bowman, I, I not familiar with, so couldn't tell you much. So, like, I guess you got fine, like, fine rotation options at tight end, but how often are these guys really going to see the field when you have Evan Ingram, who, I mean, to be honest, Evan Ingram could also line up in the slot. Like, what was his slot percentage last season? 54.1%. So someone who did line up uh, when they when they would go like maybe four wide or they would hit them with like trips, stuff like that. When it comes to the running back room, they got nobody. Like this is Travis Etienne against the world. I mean, dude, at least Etienne provides some pass catching upside. Bigsby was just uh, unfortunately just kind of a hot mess last season. He he just was. That is that is facts. That is facts. Unfortunately, he just was not a good for this squad. You look at uh, what he did last year. He had two fumbles, averaged 2.34 yards after contact. 10 force missed tackles on 50 attempts, so it was pretty solid. And just didn't get it done in uh, the passing game, unfortunately. Only had one reception last year. Like He's going to be contending, I guess, for that RB2 role with Ernest Johnson, who really is more of a committee back than actual true rb2 that'll get etn off the field they just don't have a guy that can get etn off the field that is just uh for fa fa facts they just don't have that guy Ke cleveland robinson's not gonna be that guy i think he's more on this squad as a special teams player that's about it he's an undersized back it might bring some receiving upside to the squad but like i i don't see him really having a significant cut in this offense you have some other udfas here you got lorenzo lingard who oh, where did he come from he had akron who he ended up running a 447 pretty solid the agility numbers were nothing special and to be fair like he was like he brings receiving upside that's about it but as a pass blocker nothing special like, yeah, if anything, I'm kind of excited for Jalen Jackson, who out of Villanova, I actually had him higher than Cleveland Robinson. Not to say Jalen Jackson's going to be someone that can make the squad. He's not a speed guy. He's just not in a run of 4.62, but he is a force miss tackle player. He is. You look at his yards after contact at Villanova, they were over five yards. Like, this was someone that was just extremely hard to bring down. He also brings pass block and ability so i'm actually he's like a guy to look out for i, I think it's going to be hard to make the squad consider and they invested a fifth in robinson and at that point who is he going to usurp probably not johnson probably not tank because tank was a third round pick so it's kind of an uphill battle but i think jalen jackson is someone you should at least take note of when it comes to this uh running back room and then uh, just quickly go over the quarterbacks. You got T-Mac. It said T-Mac. You got Mac Jones, Mac and Cheese here as the backup quarterback. Nothing special, uh, as you can tell from his uh, last couple of seasons there with the Patriots. But someone who was a first-round pick, someone who is, kind of prides himself on being a very accurate, precise passer on the short to intermediate, might not have the biggest arm, but... I think someone who probably could be a higher end backup in the NFL. Uh, to be fair, Beathard got y'all a victory last season in his start against the Panthers, but that was the Panthers. Uh, and I thought did a solid job filling in for Trevor Lawrence in that overtime loss against the uh, Bengals. So, like, I, I kind of think backup. I mean, regardless, one of these guys are going to stick on the roster as an emergency quarterback. But, like, I don't think it's a sure thing that QB2 is going to be Mac Jones. And then the the depth there on the offensive line, it's, it's just a lack thereof. It's just kind of the case. Like, Walker Little's, I, I like Walker Little. I think he could have maybe some 
starter potential uh how high is the upside when it comes to his starting potential might not be that high but when he had to step in i think he did a solid job uh he could be in line to if like ezra cleveland ends up just not being a good fit here could end up being the left guard but also keep in mind walker little is on the final year of his contract tyler shantley is more of this uh just interior player like it's guard it's center it's one of the two he's only going to step in if injuries occur luke fortner just now under the learning tree of mitch morris but his contract will be up in two years mitch morris's contract will be up in two years i feel like it's more likely they decide to unless they could bring fortner back for cheap and want to give him another go they're probably looking to the center well again in another couple of years i think that's just going to be facts uh javon foster i think has potential as a high-end backup maybe even as a starter at some point but you're kind of hoping that doesn't come early in his career cooper hodges i believe was a tackle at appalachian state or maybe a guard i can't remember from that 2023 class uh <laughs> If anything, you're developing him as a potential backup. Yeah, Appalachian State. Uh, but yeah, you're developing his, him as a backup. Uh, Cole Van Lannan, he was with the Packers for a little bit as a developmental tackle. Stephen Jones played a lot of tackle at Oregon as UDFA's big body. doesn't move well. Uh, Blank Hance kind of got thrown to the Wolves at points last season, unfortunately. Uh, he's really nothing more than depth. Couldn't tell you much about the other couple of guys here in Sutherland and uh, Williams. So is it a great group of backups? No, but it's also not like the worst in the league, I suppose. But at the end of the day, this is what I, I, I have. This offense is like a C minus C. I think they're going to be middle of the pack again, maybe even C plus. They're going to be in that like C tier for me, unless you see a significant like boost from Trevor Lawrence. Then start fallen on the right side of the coin he starts getting production from his pass catchers in terms of yards after the catch uh he, you, you get a better bit of luck when it comes to yards negated because of penalties uh the run game can, can be consistent maybe they get a bit more creative the offensive line ends up being better than expected they can stay healthy because like they have good players on the offensive line they do it's just, you know, there there are some legitimate concerns here and there. So it's like, I, I just I feel like this is it's probably a safer bet that this is this might end up be end up being more of a middle of the group, maybe like a, a maybe 16th to like 24th type of offense. They're just going to be in that range probably for me. So we'll see. Maybe they uh, overachieve. But let's go ahead. Let's talk some defense. So when talking about this defense, these are the guys that I think are going to be the lead snap getters, the guys that are going to be on the field the most, of course, injury withstanding. And you can tell I'm a bit middle of the pack when it comes to this defense. Uh, they got some stars here and there. They really do. They got some good talent on this squad. Uh, but like, I'm a little hesitant, depending on like who can break out where, on saying, like, are, are they any, can they become like a top 10, top 12 defense in the NFL? But I do think they're going to benefit from ryan nielsen and schematically what he can do with this squad particularly as ru like run defenders i think this team has a chance to be like a top 10 top 12 run defense in the league but when it comes to the pass rush i have a little bit more questions just because of a little bit of the age on the inside and uh more so with like maybe trevon walker will he break out because like last year josh Heinz Allen now taking uh, his mother's maiden name uh, so we won't get him confused again with quarterback Josh Allen but Allen bro broke out last year and some people were like well he kind of already broke out we knew he was hella good but I mean when breaking out like he broke out and said hey I'm one of the top pass rushers in in the league and yes he is 90 pressures 19 sacks via PFF insane insane he is a top five in my opinion pass rusher in the nfl and really be, has become more of a complete player since coming out of kentucky where he was more of this athletic uh athletic toolsy prospect 
since then, like he's put on the bulk, gotten better play strength. He's become way more polished, added a lot more, uh, just a lot more pass rush moves to his arsenal, a lot of pass rush moves to the toolbox. You see the hand counters. He's a much more complete player. So now we're talking about an elite level player and you look over across from him and I still think we're looking like, I think he's on the up and up in Trevon Walker, but we are still looking at someone who is still for the most part, a athletic and like physical, like toolsy freak who's still trying to iron out some of the wrinkles in his game and we saw a bit of a breakout a little bit from last year 59 pressures he had uh, i think 11 sacks but you look at like the pass rush win rate last season for the jags and you look at of course you got like the dominant josh hines allen at 20.5 percent that's an insane number when it comes to pass rush and yes that's among the elite pass rushers in the NFL. And then opposite, Trevon Walker, 9.7. I do think he's trending in the right direction, but I still think we have a ways to go. And he is going to benefit from being a cross of Josh Hines Allen. But how big of a jump are we going to see next year? So I'm being a little bit more reserved, a little bit more conservative in my projection when it comes to this pass rushing squad. And I mean, you go to the interior. And you have either like injured, unproven, or old players. And not to say they're not productive, like, dude, e Eric Armstead, like he's coming off the meniscus injury, but he's still product productive at, what, 31 years old? He's about to be 31 years old. Last year, 58 pressures, eight sacks. That does include the postseason, though. So you're kind of hoping he comes back from the injury and he's still a hella solid. You have Roy Robertson Harris, who was an addition from like the prior coaching staff, but a very solid player that has really kind of ironed out his, I keep saying ironed out, but like carved out his role with this squad last season, four pressure or 42 pressures in four sacks, but he's 31. So he's on the older side. So we could go ahead and take a look at the depth of this squad and see, okay, well then who are the next guys up? Because I think the obvious thing to say here is guys like uh, Robertson, Harris and Armstead are going to be mentoring the next generation of your interior. So let's look at that potential next generation of the interior as it's of course got to start with Mason Smith, Mason Smith, total physical toolsy freak. Got a long way to develop, but you kind of like you kind of like taking a shot on that. I love that roll of the dice. I think that was phenomenal. Uh, you have Devon Hamilton, who's coming off injury last year. I think he played what all of uh, eight games last year. I think he played about twenty percent of snaps last season, and you, you kind of hoping he comes back from injury because he he actually kind of fills out more of that. Uh, a gap roll like nose like space eating nose tackle at 335 but you also bring in now jordan jefferson who not as big but that's kind of his role he likes playing under center uh you got some other guys in like jeremiah ledbetter who was a good rotation good backup player for this team last season uh, Adam Gatiss is still on this squad. Tyler Lacey is more of a tweener coming out of, I believe it was Oklahoma State. So, like, there's still some questions there. Like, again, when it comes to the interior, you got age, you got injury, and then you got some unprovenness. So, it's like, okay, how, how, does, the, how does this work? How does this function? Can they stay healthy? We will see because, I mean, Armstead is starting the year on the pup. Uh, when it comes to the edge talent behind Walker and behind uh, Heinz Allen, when you look at the snap total, like, uh, here we go. Uh, who, who was the next edge up last season as it was uh, Dewan Smoot, who had 340. I imagine the next player up for that is probably going to be Travis uh, Gibson, who, again, Hasn't been, hasn't really shown that potential since his, like, I think it was his rookie season or his second year. 
but you know it's there. Yeah, I think the potential to be a high-end rotation player is still there. But they also drafted just a year ago Yazir Abdullah, who was a bit more of a tweener coming out, who played in coverage, but also was a very uh, effective pass rusher uh, last year. Just played 45 snaps. Uh, was he injured at parts of last year? Because he only played five games. Mm, can't confirm that off the uh, top of my head or anything I have in the notes. But uh, he might be someone who ends up getting a jump. Uh, behind those guys, it's like Miles Cole probably makes the practice squad. You have another Andre Carter here. Hold up. As a UDFA. I'm trying to think, where did you come from, Mr. Andre Carter? You were Indiana. Oh, watch out for him. He's a bit bullish. Not really, like, athletically gifted, but high motor, good play strength, good pop. Like, probably a long shot to make the actual roster. Probably ends up being a... Uh, a practice squad player but i'm intrigued i'm intrigued and then uh let's go like because i'm not uh, when it comes to ryan nielsen it's not like this dude doesn't blitz ever but but he has utilized one Caden ellis very effectively and timely as a blitzer again he'll work those stunts and like sometimes it's not bringing extra pressure when he brings in like a Caden Ellis, but maybe drop in one of the like an edge player uh, back in coverage and having his linebacker come up and be that fourth pass rusher. And I mean, I think I think Devin Lloyd's kind of primed for that role. Like coming out, he was very effective as a blitzer uh, coming out of Utah last year. Only uh, 11 pressures, but that was only on 66 pass rush snaps. You look at uh, Oye Aluakun, who was more so the blitzer. He had 103 pass rush snaps, 21 pressures, three sacks. So typically you could probably use both those guys as rushers. It's just I kind of lean more to who, what linebacker do I want to leave in coverage? It's probably Aluakun because... I think he's just the better athlete, but like Lloyd definitely improved in terms of coverage. He had seven pass breakups last year, but he's allowing your typical 70, 75% when it comes to his completion rate uh, allowed. But like, may, I don't know, maybe you could get tricky with either one of those guys, but low key, this is probably one of the better linebacker duos in the NFL that don't really get a lot of shine. I think they're a bit underrated at this point, especially like Devin, Devin Lloyd kind of like breaking out and having a very, very solid season, especially as a run defender. And he's just going to eat, eat in, uh, I think, in Nielsen's defense. I 100% believe that. When it comes to the depth behind those guys, you still have Chad Muma, who is a uh, third round pick out of the 2022 draft coming out of Wyoming. Uh, I think he's probably going to, he's probably more of a run stuffer. And then you have Ventrell Miller, who's a bit all around. I think last year he had his uh, year cut short because of injury. I think it was even before the season. Uh, I forgot specifically what the injury was, but very unfortunate. But someone who I think was going to at least immediately be a special teams darling for this squad. Some of the other guys they have, Ty Summers, he's been around the league. Uh, it feels like a while. He's kind of jumped around teams this juncture. Not too familiar with Caleb Johnson. Uh, and then some of the UDFAs they got at linebacker, I couldn't really tell you much about. Didn't evaluate these guys like Trey Kaiser, Andrew Parker Jr. They're, again, just guys I, I didn't evaluate during the process. So they're kind of uh, mysteries to me, if you will. But I'm v feeling very positive about this linebacker group. When it comes to the secondary, you have Tyson Campbell freshly off getting paid. And honestly, the talent is there. Last year, unfortunately, he was a little banged up. Like, uh, hey, I'm going to go to bat for Campbell. His first half of the season was a hell of a lot better than his second half where he was returning from injury. You look at his first six games last year, only allowing three touchdowns. Uh, he had a very solid completion rate. But then he returns in week 10. Uh, he, he was dealing with the quad and then the hamstring, returned in week 13, and then didn't come back again until week 16. Couldn't stay healthy. And during that, what, five-game stretch, he allowed 
five touchdowns so essentially a touchdown a game though there was a game there where he allowed none in one where he allowed two touchdowns but prior to that like again he started off the year so much better so i and you look at his past couple of seasons going back to his rookie year uh, allowed a completion rate of 67 percent and that was with two interceptions eight pass breakups allowed four touchdowns last year where he was a bit more targeted but allowed a completion rate of 60 percent Allowed six touchdowns, but there was nine pass breakups, three interceptions. And then this year, it kind of fell apart there again, because in large part, because of the injury, it, it, it really did. So I do expect him to be better now that he's healthy. And honestly, the scheme probably works out a little bit better for him anyway, just because he's a fast and fantastic athlete but then opposite of them you do have ronald darby who uh, i mentioned earlier when we were talking about the additions this is a guy that can you trust health wise probably not really and he's someone that hasn't really been a playmaker uh since 2019 so he's really at this juncture just like a bridge replacement level starter and you're going to be hoping for someone there in the depth to kind of maybe step up and be that heir apparent, but I'm not sold that they have that guy there yet. And then Darnell Savage, he signs with this squad. I think this is a good fit schematically. He's a better man defense, like a man coverage player. Uh, I think he was better suited to be a nickel defender, a slot corner uh, there in Joe Barry's defense. He really played more of a safety role and it, honestly, it just didn't work out. So he's kind of hoping to get uh, a, a second chance here in honestly a scheme and a role that I think benefits him a bit better. You have in Antonio Johnson, who's going to now be your like box esque safety, who's coming off a year where he didn't play a ton. Uh, his snaps last year was just under 200, but I, he was relatively effective in those 200 snaps. He had two interceptions. Uh, he played really well around the line of scrimmage in the box. Uh, he had a Missed tackle rate at 6.7%. So pretty darn solid. And even as a blitzer, like three pressures, one sack. And that was on only eight pass rushing snaps. So you're going to rev up this guy's snap total next year as a full starter. And he was someone I really liked coming out of Texas A&M. So I'm kind of excited about that. Uh, and then Andre Cisco, I absolutely love Cisco. We don't really talk about Cisco as one of the better safeties in the NFL. At least I don't think we do. Uh, I don't see him get enough love, so it kind of feels like he's underrated. And I get it coming out of Syracuse. He was kind of this boom-bust type of player, a guy that had the th has this ball-hawking ability, but also you're going to have to put up with some of the coverage busts. But, I mean, last year, four interceptions. Did, did allow two touchdowns. Not bad at all. So, like, I think he could be due for a big breakout season this year under – ryan neil uh nielsen so i'm really really excited about that but let's look at the depth because i did comment on just the lack of depth when it came to corner on the outside because like who's the next guy up could it be jerry and jones i talked a little bit about him in depth when we talked about the uh, draft picks and he's got inside outside versatility but honestly might end up just being a better slot player here and with savage where you're kind of rolling the dice and hoping that he does benefit from the change in scenery and the change of scheme that's not an absolute that might not happen so the addition of jerry jones is probably more in line with the slot that's currently where our lads has him listed and then like if we are going to talk about the next guy up it's probably materic uh monteric brown who was formerly out of arkansas i believe uh seventh round pick in the 2022 draft he was their fourth corner uh, in terms of snaps last season behind Darius Williams, who's no longer here. Uh, Tyson Campbell. Uh, who's the other guy? Uh, Trey Herndon, who is no longer here as well. So he's probably in the next one in line. And to be fair, wasn't that good uh, when he came out. He looks like a, a backup player. That's what it is. So you're kind of hoping for someone else to maybe step up, uh, whether that is uh, DeAndre Prince, again, fifth round player, though. You're not going to expect him to produce uh, much. And I do have questions about him in this scheme. Uh, Trey Flowers, journeyman at this point. Uh, Amani Ariwari, dude, he's here. And he's actually a really good scheme fit. Uh, he's fresh off. I don't know where he was last year. I know he had stints with, uh, was it the Texans? 
uh, initially drafted by the Lions. Can't recall, but good fit for the scheme, but probably someone on the uh, roster bubble. Uh, you have Tavon Campbell, another guy who's kind of familiar with what Nielsen typically runs. Not necessarily through uh, Nielsen, but is familiar with this scheme. Christian Braswell, couldn't, ugh, can't really call too much about him from the uh, 2023 draft. He was a six-round player out of Rutgers. Okay, okay. So I don't think it was someone that I necessarily got to or at least did a full eval on. I can't recall. Uh, so I couldn't tell you much about him, but he is a six-round player. So even if he steps in, you're probably not expecting much. Uh, Gregory Jr., I know got a little bit of hype uh, last year. Kind of hoping he would have... Uh, a bit of a bigger role that didn't really come to fruition. Ended up only playing uh, about 100 snaps. Did play in five games. Uh, and now there's competition at that slot position. Keep in mind, coming out of, what was it? Like, uh, was it like something Baptist? Uh, it was or Orkita Baptist. Okay, can't pronounce that. But I, he kind of made a name for himself at the Senior Bowl. Uh, back in 2022 uh, but again now the competition there in the slash is too much uh, at safety you probably want to have the, have one of the best backup safeties in the NFL there I said it in Andrew Wingard whenever this dude has his name called they need him to come in and step in I think he does a hell of a good job really good special team player but also a guy that does produce he allowed Last year, and this was on about 400 snaps, a 63.6% uh, completion rate, threw in a pass, prote uh, pass breakup and a interception to boot, allowed no touchdowns. Again, one of the better backup safeties in the NFL. Daniel Thomas, more of a special team player. And then you have uh, Terrell Emmons, who's going to compete for a spot here, but ultimately I think he's probably just going to be uh, a roster cut when it's all said and done. So... Like there's parts that I like, but you got you got to admit, man. There's questions when it comes to uh, if, if injury does occur, which honestly probably does happen. You have Campbell coming off kind of an injury plagued year. You have Darby, who's just not really been healthy in recent years, and you just don't have the depth behind those guys. Darnell Savage is is he gonna produce, or is he just gonna be the same level of player that we saw the last couple of years? Like, I feel good about the safety room, but Antonio Johnson, we're basing that off of a very small sample size. So, like, there's fair questions in this secondary. Like, at the end of the day, like, I'll go out on a limb. I don't think I, I don't think it's really going out on a limb, but I do think I'm under underrating this defense. I definitely think my grades are low for what this defense is going to turn out to be next year, and I feel a bit higher on it. Uh, it's just for me, again, I kind of gravitate more towards uh, being a bit more conservative in my grading. But if I did have to project or like project, I do think the pass rush probably would be, should be closer to like a B plus. Uh, the run def defense is probably in that B plus to A minus range. If it's anything like what we saw with uh, Nielsen in Atlanta or when he was with the Saints. Uh, the coverage, I think C plus is probably a safe grade anyway for the coverage. So that's probably one thing I probably won't change. But I, I am excited to see what this defense actually, or at least ultimately, outputs on in 2024. Speaking of which, let's talk about 2024. Let's project how this team's going to do. The Jaguars last year had the sixth toughest schedule and... It gets a little bit better, but I still have them as the 10th most difficult schedule in the NFL. Let's go ahead, see what this team's ceiling can be. If they can hit all their high notes, if they uh, if they expand the playbook, if Trevor Lawrence, if he gets a bit, bit better luck-wise, if he gets more production after the catch from those wide receivers, the run game's better. The defense is better than anticipated. Like I said, I've kind of underrated the defense. Let's check out what that ceiling could look like. As they start the season against the Dolphins, it will be a home game for the Dolphins. I think that's kind of a tough win, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility for the Jags to win that game or travel to Cleveland and, well, travel to back to Jacksonville, travel home, and beat the Browns. They do get the Bills. That's a little bit tougher. I'm a little higher on the Bills uh, than I am the Dolphins. 
So let's say maybe they lose that game, but I think they'll probably, there's maybe a chance they split. They, they probably split with the Texans. And I think there's a good chance they probably split with the Colts if the Colts are healthy, but I will give them this win at home. I think they could beat the Bears. The Bears are kind of, you know, they got rookie quarterback. We'll see how they do. They got a new OC. So, like, expecting them to have some early season struggles, I think, is fair. I think they could beat a team like the uh, Patriots. They could definitely surprise the Packers. Traveling to, to Philly, I mean, I think this is Philly, they're going to resemble more of the team we saw in 2022 than what we saw in 2023. And even though like 2023 ended up being this big flop of a year for the Eagles, they were still a very tough team to beat. So I think I'll go with the Eagles winning that. Um, I'll give them wins against the uh, the Vikings. You have to go to Detroit prior to your bye week. You probably need that rest. So I can see the Lions winning in Detroit. Uh, coming out of your bye week, you get the Texans. I feel like that you're primed for a victory there. Let's say you sweep the Titans, a team that uh, has a new coaching staff in tow there. You're going to get a true rookie season, so to speak, out of Will Levis. So we're just going to go ahead and give you two wins against the Titans. Uh, depending on how the Jets look and how healthy they are at the end of the year, maybe that's a victory as well. Uh, you could say the same thing about the Raiders here. Uh, and again, I'm going to give the Colts, I'm going to say you split with the Colts, but that puts them at a 12 win ceiling for me. And I think that is, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Can it go higher? Yeah, man. I, this team started the year eight and three last season. They, if they finished that hot, then this probably would have been a, like a 12 and five win team by the end of last season. And we wouldn't be discussing Oh, is this team, can they get over the hump? Are they just mediocre? Is Trevor Lawrence just meh? Like, we wouldn't be asking those questions. We wouldn't. So, when it comes to my projection, I do think with a little bit of turnover, some new faces here and there, will Doug Peterson, will, will, will he be a bit more efficient as a play caller? I think having them at a 10-7 and 7 window is a bit of a safer projection. I do think they're going to be in that AFC South contention. They're going to be well in the playoff race. Matter of fact, I think uh, I do have them making the playoffs. And I do th expect them to be better than last year, especially if they could stay healthy. Again, this team was 8-3 and three to begin the year. And then it wasn't just injury why this team kind of fell apart at the back half of the season. It wasn't just injury, but it was kind of a culmination of a few different things. So I don't know. You let me know what you think in the comment section below, Jags fans. Do you think this is a fair assessment of your team? If you want to check out a deep dive on division rival Indianapolis Colts, I did that video right here. Or you could take an early look at the 2025 NFL draft class because I've been doing my summer scouting you can check out a video for that down here. But as always, until next time, you be easy, my friends. Later.